what better time to talk about ice than in the middle of February in New Jersey, right? At least this, this February. So what I'm going to do in this, in this talk is connect water, the structure of water and some of its important properties with some other important things like climate, sea level, weather, and a few other things. When I, as usual, when I started getting into this, you know, preparing for this, I figured out that I have enough material for half a dozen seminars. In fact, we could probably teach a course in water. I shouldn't say that. The department chair is here and she's taking notes. Right? So this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, what I'm going to do here is only look at a couple of, uh, of the consequences of the properties of water because there are way too many to cover in an hour or maybe even in a week or a month or something like that. So anyway, water is a very simple compound, a very small molecule. H, everybody knows it's H2O. It, it's got this bent structure, the, the negative and positive charges here. By the way, delta simply is a symbol for a partial charge, uh, less than one, fractional. Uh, but it tells you that the molecule has, a, has an overall polarity. It's got a negative end and a positive end. Um, that's important. It turns out a lot of the properties of water depend on that, on that polarity. Uh, it's made up of two of the most common elements in the universe, and that means water is everywhere not just on Earth, but in, I mean, comets are largely water. Um, all the planets except Mercury have some water on them. Mercury is too hot. It's all boiled off. Uh, it's present in interstellar space. It's, it's, water is one of the, it may be the most, but certainly one of the most common compounds in, in the universe. And that's because, I said, hydrogen is by far the most abundant element. Oxygen is the most abundant element in the, on the Earth's crust. Um, there's less hydrogen mainly because a lot of hydrogen escapes. We don't have a gravitational field that holds on to it. Um, and also, both of these are very reactive elements. So water is formed spontaneously from hydrogen and oxygen under a, a variety of different conditions. Uh, notice all the other elements. There's very little, the amount of hydrogen on Earth on the crust is, is small. That's a little misleading because this is by weight and hydrogen is so light. By numbers of atoms, hydrogen is more abundant um, than, than this. Um, of course, most of that hydrogen is in the ocean. Oh, look at that nice black spot there. Okay. Uh, th you can't read all this, and I won't, I won't read the whole thing, but this is sort of a preview of where we're going with this. Water has a bunch of properties, um, mostly physical, some chemical. We're going to focus on the physical ones. But they all have consequences. For example, um, one of the unique or almost unique properties of water is that its density increases near its freezing point. Most things density in, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, decreases near its freezing point. Most things the density increases. And in fact, when it freezes, ice, as you'll see, is about 9% less dense than water. In other words, the fact that we, this is something we take for granted, water, ice floats on water, right? Throw some ice cubes in your Diet Coke and they float. That's a very unusual property. Most substances of any type, the, when, when they freeze, the solid sinks to the bottom because the solid is more dense than the liquid. Water has the opposite property. That's extremely important because when bodies of water freeze, they freeze at the top, and they rarely, unless you have a winter like this and they're fairly shallow, they rarely freeze all the way down. Most bodies of water, even large ones, or especially large ones, have a layer of ice on top but liquid water underneath. If water had the opposite, the common property, then lakes would freeze from the bottom up, and there wouldn't be any fish in the winter. I mean, the, you know, the, Aquatic life couldn't survive sub-freezing temperatures because the whole body of water would freeze. So that's, that's one of the simple properties that has some profound consequences. The melting and boiling points are very high for a compound of its molecular weight. It's a very small molecule, but it has a relatively high melting and boiling point, which is why it can exist as a liquid you know, under our conditions. 
Methane, for example, has almost the same melting, uh, same molecular weight as water, CH4 versus H2O. Methane is a gas down to about minus 200 degrees Celsius. Water is a liquid below 100 degrees Celsius. A huge difference in, in boiling point. And also the melting point's much higher. Um, these two things are very important. The heat capacity and the heat of vaporization. Heat, of capac heat capacity is essentially um, how much heat you can put into something to raise the temperature, let's say, one degree. Things with very low heat capacities, like metals, you need very little heat to increase the temperature. That's why when you put a pot of water on the stove, the handles of the pot get really hot. It doesn't take much heat to raise the temperature of metal. Water, on the other hand, again, if you think of boiling water for spaghetti, you have to put an enormous amount of heat in there to just raise the temperature. Then if you want to boil it, you run into the heat of vaporization, which is one of the highest, certainly the highest known for a small molecule like this, one of the highest of any molecules. Heat of vaporization is the amount of heat you need to change the liquid to the gas. Uh, those are both extremely high for water, and they, they have a lot to do with climate. Uh, the, the high heat capacity is why um, bodies of water like the ocean or large lakes moderate temperatures, because it takes a lot of heat to warm up the, the ocean in the summer, and, in, and it retains heat for a long time in the winter. So that means if you're near a large body of water, the temperature doesn't change as much. The further inland you go, the more uh, the temperature fluctuates. Uh, the heat of vaporization really drives the weather, and we'll get to that along with the details. It has a very high surface tension. Surface tension is the tendency to, to uh, contract to form spherical drops. Water has a very high surface tension for its size and, and molecular structure, and that has a lot to do with drop formation, rain, and so on, among other things. Um, we won't talk much about this. The, the greenhouse effect, um, water is a major player in the greenhouse effect, although it's not something we want to get rid of in the atmosphere, but it is a greenhouse gas. Um, and, it, and again, I won't, this is, a, this is a topic for another seminar or course, maybe. Water is the best solvent for many, many compounds, including minerals, ionic compounds, things like that. And this, the solvent properties of water have a lot to do with geology. You know, how, how minerals are deposited and dissolved and moved around. And if you teach a geology course, you're talking about water a lot. And this is one substance, right? Um, here's a picture of the water cycle. Again, I'm not going to dwell on most of this stuff. But for example, you know, water evaporates from the ocean, condenses to form clouds, and back to form precipitation. It, it precipitates up in the mountains, there's runoff, and so on. So the water is constantly cycling through the, uh, uh, the geologic uh, environment of the Earth. Um, even up in the atmosphere, clouds provide reflective cover. Clouds actually lower the surface temperature because they reflect light back into, the, into space. Um, so th there's there's that kind of thing. They also, water itself also absorbs uh, thermal radiation. That's why it's a, a greenhouse gas. Here's another picture. This is suitably framed. I don't know why somebody put a frame there. Uh, but again, you can see that, that there's a constant cycling of water through the, through the environment as both a liquid, a gas, and a solid in the form of ice and snow. So all three phases are involved. And again, that's a consequence of the fact that it has a very high melting point and boiling point for such a simple molecule. So what are these properties and why are they important? Well, the first one we're going to look at is the heat of vaporization. It has a very, water has a very large heat of vaporization. And you, again, you know that if you've ever tried to boil water. It takes a lot of heat to boil uh, any quantity of water, really. And that we, that we understand we take for granted, especially if you cook, you know. On the other hand, and that, by the way, is, is why, you know, uh, the, the ocean can absorb a lot of heat and evaporation 
uh, moderates the temperature. On the other hand, this is less obvious, but equally and probably even more important. If, if it takes a certain amount of energy to take liquid water, let's say 10 grams of liquid water and vaporize it, so you're adding energy. But that means if you take 10 grams of water vapor and condense it to a liquid, what happens? That energy has to be released. And most of the time it's released as heat. So in other words, water absorbs heat when it evaporates or boils, but it releases heat when it condenses. That energy that's released by the condensation of water vapor to liquid is what drives mu much of the weather we see, particularly storms. Uh, the energy in a storm, well, the energy in all weather phenomena, um, wind, storms, not earthquakes, but I mean weather, you know, meteorological, ultimately comes from the sun, right? It's, it's energy hits the earth from the sun. That's converted ultimately to water vapor. Much of it, any, you know, the uh, sun heats the ocean, water evaporates. But that water, when it evaporates, forms clouds. And then when it condenses to form liquid, that releases heat. And that, in other words, it's basically a transformation of solar energy into into thermal energy and, and then motion. Uh, for example, in a, in a thunderstorm, uh, thunderstorms have very high clouds, very high towering clouds that go way up into the stratosphere. What happens here, and I'm not a meteorologist, I, I have no intimate knowledge of the physics and, and behavior of thunderstorms, but essentially what happens is water vapor rises up, but when it gets up into the stratosphere where the temperature is very low, it condenses. The water vapor condenses to liquid and ice. And both of those processes release heat. So that produces a warming which creates an updraft, just like your chimney, right? If you, if you light some wood or paper in your, in, your, in your fireplace, the rising air creates an updraft and that pulls in more. So there's a, the updraft is caused by the condensation of water vapor up in the upper stratosphere. That's why the taller the, 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 and I think I'm right about this, but the taller the cloud stack in a thunderstorm, the more updraft there is. That's why the biggest thunderstorms have the, you know, these huge clouds that stretch way up into the stratosphere. And then you get disaster movies with airplanes flying through them and, you know, uh, tornadoes are an extreme case of that, where the updraft becomes so strong that it drives a, a, a helical uh, wind pattern. Now, all that wind energy, which is what causes most of the destruction, certainly in a tornado, but even in a thunderstorm, that wind energy was ultimately solar energy, because the solar energy converted the liquid water to water vapor, and the condensation of the water vapor in the upper stratosphere released that energy back into the atmosphere and caused this the updraft which led to all the the circulation so it's ultimately this this property of water the large heat of vaporization and the fact that water can exist in all three states in our environment solid liquid and gas that provides the energy for these for these storms uh, also hurricanes hurricanes are even more complicated but in some ways, they're even easier to understand because in a hurricane, as you probably know, hurricanes generally only form over warm water. Um, usually in, in, you know, in, the, in the low latitudes around the equator where the water is always warm, but warmer, of course, in certain seasons. And they tend, if they come to the northeast, they tend to follow the Gulf Stream up because that's where the warm water is. Uh, the warm water provides the water vapor that drives the, the engine again, because the water vapor, water evaporates, and that updraft, but interestingly enough, the updraft doesn't come from down here, it comes from up here. Right? The condensation occurs up in the, in the top, so that's why I think when you, you know, every once in a while I get hooked on the weather channel, um, when they start talking about you know wind shear that knocks off the top of a hurricane, again to get a really strong updraft, you need these clouds to be way up in the in the stratosphere, so that there's a huge updraft caused by the condensation of water vapor in, in the upper reaches and releasing the heat up there. 
And I couldn't resist putting a few pictures in. That's Hurricane Andrew, which I think was 92. I think it was 1992. Hurricane Andrew was a very tight hurricane that cut right across uh, just south of Miami. I have a cousin who lives down there, and her house was knocked off the foundation by Andrew. It was almost like a giant tornado. But you can see how, how tightly wound this thing is. This is Katrina, a much larger storm, but even more destructive, obviously. And again, shows that classic spiral pattern, counterclockwise rotation. And the last one I have is, is Sandy, which was technically not a hurricane, but was even huger. This stretches out over an enormous area. The, the eye, there wasn't a real eye, but it's in here somewhere. I, when did it, where did it come across on uh, uh, Atlantic City, basically, right? The eye pretty much hit Atlantic City. Yeah. But again, that was driven, and Sandy followed the Gulf Stream up. Uh, pretty much, you know, the warm water, because Sandy was pretty late in the season. The ocean was starting to cool down, but uh, there was still enough warm water. So again, this, particularly the heat of vaporization of water, is what drives these things. The fact that water in our, on our planet can, um, can be a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Most of the time it's a liquid. But that the transitions between uh, particularly liquid to, to gas, but even from solid to liquid, both of those absorb energy but release energy when you go in the other direction. And, and essentially what that does is act as a giant converter for converting solar energy to uh, essentially wind and, and other mechanical forms of energy. Um, these are significant. I, I mentioned the melting and boiling points are, are quite high, but notice what the range here. Uh, the average temperature on the Earth is somewhere around 15 degrees Celsius, I think, overall. Isn't that right? It's somewhere around there. Pretty close, anyway. Um, and of course, can range from not close to boiling, but certainly up to around uh, the mid 40s Celsius, which is 110, 120, uh, down to uh, my brother-in-law lives in Connecticut. He said it was minus 11 yesterday morning. Coldest point on Earth lately has been the top of Mount Washington, which was, I think, minus 60. But notice that span you know, includes the liquid and solid and, and even the vapor range of water. So water, and you know, I'd say, wow, water is perfectly adapted to Earth. It's the other way around, of course. I mean, the, the presence of a lot of water on, on the Earth is pretty much what it has determined our average temperature. If there weren't any water, we'd probably be a lot colder in the winter and hotter in the summer. Here's something that chemistry students dread seeing, a phase diagram. The, those of you in General Chem 1 haven't, won't see these for a while. General Chem 2, have you gotten to? We have no General Chem 2s today. I don't know if we have any in here. Phase diagram is a graph which shows you the behavior of a substance, the phase changes, called a phase diagram, solid, liquid, and gas, as a function of pressure, which is normally on the vertical axis, and temperature. This is external pressure and the temperature. Right, this is a logarithmic scale. Notice it goes from 0.006 to 1 to 218. That's not a normal linear scale. It was compressed to a logarithmic scale to make things more uh, clear. Uh, the temperature is, well, I'm not sure what the temperature scale is. It might be a little messed up too, but yeah. anyway, if, to read this, you look, look first over at the pressure. That's us, one atmosphere. So as you go over here, below 273 degrees, which is zero Celsius, water is a solid, right? When you hit that temperature, 273 Kelvin, zero degrees Celsius, it melts. Now it's a liquid. We keep heating it up up to 100 degrees Celsius, 373 turns into a gas. So that, that's essentially, the, this line of the properties of water on the surface of the Earth, give or take a few you know, millibars of pressure. Notice if you go down a lot in pressure, not much happens over here, although this is very significant. This, notice how this line slopes backwards, slopes to the, to the left. 
that's a consequence of the fact that ice is less dense than water, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what this means is as you raise the pressure, the melting point of water goes down. Right here it's 273.2, and it slowly goes down. It reaches 273 here, and here it's maybe 272.8 or something. So the temperature at which the, the water melts changes with pressure, but it changes in the opposite direction than most substances. This is, the slope of this line is why you can ice skate, basically. Because when you ice skate, you're, you, you know, you strap on these metal rails on the bottom of your feet, and if you put your weight, your entire weight on those metal rails, the pressure at the bottom is very high, because pressure is force divided by area, the area on the bottom of an ice skate is very small. The pressure is, I mean, the force is your weight. So the pressure under one of those things is quite high. What happens is the ice melts. And you, you don't actually skate on ice. You skate on a thin layer of water between the blade and the, uh, and the ice. And I haven't tested this out. But if you skate in temperatures below something like minus 20 or minus 30 Fahrenheit, it doesn't work very well because you, you know, the, the temperature gets down far enough so that ice is still a solid. I'm not going to test that out. I don't feel like ice skating sub-zero temperatures. But essentially, that's a. I don't have a video of it, but there's a demonstration where you take a big block of ice, in one of these huge that the ice men used to deliver. You know, and you put a wire, a metal wire with two weights on it over the block of ice, and you just sit it in a corner of the room. And over a period of time, because the, the weights are pulling on that thin wire, that's a lot of pressure. So the ice melts under the wire, so the wire sinks into the ice. But it freezes back to, the, the water freezes back to ice on top of the wire because the pressure drops immediately. So what happens is over a period of time, the ice, the wire migrates through the ice drops off the bottom and the block of ice is still intact. That's cool. We should have set that up there. We should have done that for the, uh, for the kids. The trouble is it takes, a long, it takes a long time if you get a big block. But it, it's kind of fun. Anyway, on this end, obviously, there's vapor. Now, the, on the Earth, most of our conditions are in here. So it's no surprise that most of the water on Earth is a liquid. I have a slide for that, but we'll get back to it, I guess. Um, but I mentioned this already. Water has this really unusual property that as it cools, I have no idea why this diagram is backwards. Usually you start with the low temperature on the left and the high temperature on the right. This one has low temperature on the right, high temperature on the left. I don't know why. But you see as you cool water, like most substances, it gets more dense. This is a specific volume. It reaches a maximum in density at a temperature of about 4 degrees above 0 Celsius. That's about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. But then it starts going up. Right? The density decreases. The specific volume goes up. So the maximum density is at 4 degrees above freezing. And here is, <coughs> if you continue that, what happens is when the, when the water freezes, so here it is. Here's the minimum. When the water freezes, the volume jumps up. We all know that water expands when you freeze it. How do you know that? Right? You put a can of beer in the freezer, figuring, I'm going to get this nice and cold. And then you start doing something else, and you forget the can of beers in the freezer. And then you have to spend a half hour cleaning out your freezer, because the, the can bursts. See, I'm relating this to everyday life. Right? Water, but that's, you know, again, what we don't appreciate, because we, we see this every day, is that that's a very unusual property. Most substances don't do that. They shrink when they freeze. They have a higher density. Water jumps up to uh, 1.0917 at one atmosphere. It's about a 9% decrease in density or a 9% increase in volume. And this is, of course, why ice floats on water. Less dense. Which means when ice forms on a body of water, it forms on the top. Now, all of this, I told you we'd get back to some chemistry here. All of this has to do with the structure of water. So you'll see a number of different depictions. We already saw just the picture with 
uh, you know, bonds and symbols. This is called a space filling model because it it's more accurately portrays the size of the uh, electron clouds. These things are much blobbier than they look um, with these ball and stick models. But nevertheless, you still see the fact that these the hydrogen ends are positive and then oxygen ends are negative, which means the hydrogen end of one molecule is attracted to the oxygen end of another. Just electro basically electrostatic attraction. That's called a hydrogen bond, which is a misnomer in the sense that it's not a true bond. It's not a permanent bond. It, 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 um, it's much weaker than a, f a regular bond, and at least in liquid water, it, it, uh, they're fluctuating. They're constantly changing, moving around. Nevertheless, it's a significant force that holds water molecules together. This is why water has such a high boiling point and such a high melting point, because to turn this into a gas, you have to separate the molecules completely and they're essentially they're sticking together. Hydrogen bonding, of course, if you've had any biology, is extremely important in protein structure, DNA structure. It's a, it's a very important phenomenon in chemistry in general. But we'll we're, we're stick to water here. Water is one of the champion hydrogen bonding substances in the universe. And what happens then is in liquid water, I have a better picture on the next slide, but in liquid water, the, hydro the, the water molecules are bouncing around randomly, but they're all close together and, and you know, fleetingly changing position and, 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 and uh, orientation, but they're constantly being held together by these hydrogen bonds. When water freezes in a, in a solid, the, the molecules are not moving. They are jiggling around. There's never, until you get down to absolute zero motion, there's always motion, but it's just in place motion. It's sort of like the difference between people milling around in a crowd or standing on the floor in a concert where you can't move at all, right? Because you're packed together. Everybody's jiggling around, but you can't. So, but the thing is, when water molecules solidify into ice, they orient themselves into the lowest energy position to maximize that hydrogen bonding. But to do that, they actually have to move a little further apart. So if, again, here's, this is using those space filling models. Water, liquid water is more randomly oriented. When the molecules set themselves into position to form the solid, they have to actually move a little further apart. And they form this very regular, ice has a very regular structure. Here's another picture of it. This is different kind of models, but the same idea. And this even more clearly, you can see that that they've kind of moved a little bit apart. You also see the hexagonal structure. There's an overall hexagonal symmetry to the ice structure. Um, water doesn't have that structure. It's, ra it's you know, random motion. But that hexagonal structure is very clearly shown in, in for example, uh, snowflakes. Most snowflakes have hexagonal symmetry because of this underlying structure. Uh, that's more aesthetic than, you know, practical significance, but, but that shape is a reflection of, of the underlying structure of the ice. The important thing is when, when water freezes, and even when it gets close to the freezing point, they have to start orienting themselves. But when water freezes, the molecules are stuck, fixed in a rigid position, but that position actually involves moving the water molecules a bit further apart than they are in liquid water. And that's, again, to maximize the, the hydrogen bonding. It's the lowest energy configuration, which, again, is an unusual property. The other, we have other prop, uh, compounds that have that property, or alloys, um, but they're getting obsolete. Um, those are you, you guys in the front row remember this stuff, right? When, when, when things were printed using movable type, and they had to pour type type was made out of metal. It still is, I guess. Somebody must still print. But nowadays, most printing is done electronically. But, but uh, type metal, metal used for pouring, uh, making type, has to have that property of expanding when it freezes, because it has to fill up the mold to give you nice sharp edges to the letter. So they, there are alloys. I forget what metals they use. Bismuth, I think, is in them. But there are alloys that have that property. You melt them 
put them in a mold and when they freeze they, they expand slightly and that fills up all the corners of the mold so you get nice sharp typefaces. But those have to be specially formulated um, uh, mixtures of metals that have that property. So I guess you could make type out of water, right? The problem is it would melt a little and it's kind of brittle. Anyway, here's another diagram with the, with the black cloud floating in the middle of it. But again, you see that when, as water um, cools down, here we've got higher temperatures on the um, left. As water cools down, the density increases, reaches a maximum, again, of about four degrees. When it starts cooling down closer to, um, to ice, it starts, the molecules start to orient themselves in the right positions to form ice. And then when they do form ice, there's this abrupt change in density down to uh, uh, 0.917. One of the practical consequences of that is that below a certain depth, the ocean temperature is always 4 degrees Celsius, 39 degrees Fahrenheit within a few degrees. Um, and the reason for that is that what happens to the pressure as you go down? Increases, right? The pressure increases with depth. The, the higher the pressure, the more the most dense form is favored. And what's the most dense form of water, right? It's liquid water at 4 degrees Celsius. It's actually, this is actually not exactly true because seawater has a slightly different, yeah, it's not exact, I, I forget what the exact temperature is. Seawater isn't pure water. The 39 degrees is the temperature of uh, maximum density for, for fresh water. But nevertheless, there is a maximum density. So, you know, the bottom of the ocean, or actually down, you can see here, down about, um, after about certainly 2,000 feet, maybe a little higher than that. Or is that meters? Meters. You know, when you get down a kilometer or so, kilometer and a half, the temperature really is constant the rest of the way down. Um, and the density is constant. Uh, the reason there are two lines here is uh, high latitude means up north or south, right? Up near the poles, north pole, south pole. Uh, there, of course, the surface temperature, the surface density is, is fairly uh, high and the surface temperature uh, is low, right? In the lower latitudes, which includes us, but certainly the tropics, the um, surface temperature can be fairly high but again, as you go down, it doesn't matter whether you're at the equator or at the poles, once you get down below a certain depth, the, the water temperature is, is pretty much constant. Um, and again, this just combines them to show the sort of inverse relationship between the density and the temperature for, for liquid water. Right, so, in other words, the fluctuations in ocean temperature are all up here. Right, and that depends on, obviously, the latitude. Generally speaking, the closer you are to the equator, the warmer the water is. But it also depends on currents. For example, places like Iceland and, and England are much warmer than they should be for their latitudes because there's a warm current. It's the, it's the Gulf Stream heading over to, to Europe. Uh, on the other hand, the west coast of the United States, you don't really, people in San Francisco don't go swimming in the ocean very often because there's a cold current coming down from Alaska that, run, that hugs the west coast. So even as far south as LA, the, the ocean temperature isn't all that uh, high. So obviously there are, there are a lot of local changes in temperature here, but once you get into the deep water, it's cold. And it stays, stays the same. So as I said, most of the water on Earth is liquid most of that liquid is salt water. 97% of the water on, on the surface of the Earth or near the surface of the Earth is, is in the oceans, right? Uh, about 1% is fresh water. That's the topic of another seminar, water resources. We're not going to do that today. Uh, we can't drink that. But the, about 2% of the, of the water on Earth is in, is in ice form, is in, in solid form. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. 20,000 years ago, a lot more of it was in, in the form of ice. Uh, the, last glacier, the last glacial maximum, LGM, was uh, around 20,000 years ago. There have been quite a few 
glaciation periods. There are, and here, here we can you do a little definitional stuff here. An ice sheet is a large chunk of ice that sits on land. An ice shelf is a chunk of ice that's still attached to land, but it's floating out into the ocean. So the sheet sits completely on land. The shelf is still attached, but it's running over into the ocean. Um, sea ice is floating ice. That's not connected to land at all. It's just floating. And th th these are important distinctions because if you think about it, sea ice, if, does, does the ocean level go up if sea ice melts? Art says no. That's because he knows this stuff. Let me ask you another question. If you have a glass of ice water and you let it sit, you don't drink any, you let it sit till the ice melts, does it overflow? No, the level stays the same. That's because when ice melts, it occupies the same volume as an equal mass of water. That's, an, that's one of Archimedes. Didn't Archimedes discover that? So floating ice can melt or freeze. You know, the, the ice levels in the ocean that are, the, you know, the ice that's not connected to land, that has nothing to do with sea level. Right? It can change salinity because ice, sea ice is, has very little salt in it. So when, when sea ice melts, it, it decreases the amount of salt, which can have consequences. But it doesn't change the level. On the other hand, when, when uh, ice sheets melt, that has a direct effect on water level because that's water that's not in the ocean until it melts and falls. It doesn't even have to melt. If, if, a, if a piece of ice that was on land gets off the land and becomes a shelf and then breaks off and floats, that increases water level. Ice shelves are interesting because they're in the middle. An ice shelf is floating. So if it melts or not, it doesn't matter. However, if it breaks off, all of a sudden sea level goes up. So people who study Antarctica worry a lot about this because a lot of the ice on the margins of Antarctica is in ice shelves. And they are rapidly disintegrating, some of them. And when they disintegrate, you know, that, that's where we get icebergs, right? They float away. But that increases, uh, that can increase it. But the main, the main source of, of sea level rise, though, is the ice sheets. If, and, and in the, um, in the um, uh, glacial periods, a lot of ice is locked up in ice sheets, so the ocean levels go, go way down. And here's a, this is just, uh, this is the North, North America the ice sheet at its maximum, the last one anyway, covered it. It's interesting for us because it, it goes right across New Jersey. Where is, Peter, you know where the terminal moraine is in New Jersey? Is it up in the Wachungs or? Okay, around, the, okay. This is not far from us. We're probably, we're probably right near the, yeah. And it also goes right across Long Island. Uh, you can't see Long Island on here, but. But you can see that it was kind of irregular, but it covered much of all of Canada and much of, of, of what is now the United States. Uh, Greenland actually was under, I don't know why it didn't show it. But notice there was some ice-free stuff up here. Uh, this is why people were able to come across even before the glaciers uh, disappeared, even before the ice sheet disappeared, because this part was actually open, or at least open enough for people to, to get through. Um, on the European side, it didn't get that far south, but much of England was covered, Scandinavia, up into Russia. But there were also, the Alps were under their own. Right now, there are glaciers left in the Alps, but they're small. But in, in the last glaciation, this was all ice. And you can see, they, it's a little hard to see, but this grayish area is the shoreline. The shoreline here was there, so all of England and Ireland was one was connected to the continent. Um, and the North Sea and the Baltic didn't exist as seas. They were, uh, they were exposed as land because um, the sea level was so low. Because all that water was locked up in the ice sheets. Uh, Asia also, you can see, not too much. This is totally indecipherable. But, but the, the famous land bridge across here allowed human beings to go across, though the Paleo-Indians came across from Asia 
uh, right at the end of the last glaciation. And then when the, when the ice sheet melted, they were able to go down into North and eventually into South America. But the water levels, the ocean level was very low. And then temperature started going up and the ice sheets started to melt, break up. Uh, modern sea levels, it's actually more like about 8,000 years ago, but it's an interesting time frame because eight or 10,000 years ago is the beginning of the Neolithic era, which is when human beings really started to settle down and grow crops and the population started to increase. Before this, people were essentially all hunters and gatherers wandering around following the herds. Um, and probably the reason, the ne one of the things that triggered the Neolithic Revolution was the fact that the climate was both warming, sea levels were rising, and the land was becoming a lot more hospitable for, for things like agriculture. There was a lot of fluctuations. Um, I read a book once which it wasn't the most exciting book, it was kind of scholarly, but it described conditions during the medieval warm period, which was from around, I think it was around 900 AD to 1100 or 1200. Um, this is when, um, for example, uh, the Vikings um, settled Greenland and got to North America. And uh, Greenland was one of the first real estate scams in recorded history. Eric the Red called it Greenland it wasn't really all that green, but he called it Greenland mainly to attract settlers. You know, he probably had brochures and uh, you know, I got some land for you. For, fortunately, he didn't get down as far as Florida, then it would have been all over. Um, and what happened though is there, there were Viking settlements, thriving settlements in Greenland along the coast up until around, I think it was around 1100 AD, when the temperature started going down again and essentially they had to be abandoned because it was impossible. I mean, they were growing crops and raising sheep and things like that, but the temperatures dropped enough so that Greenland became not uninhabitable. The Eskimos or the natives, whatever they're called up there, stayed, but the Vikings couldn't uh, do what Vikings do, uh, so they had to abandon it. Greenland was then abandoned. Uh, there was also a little ice age uh, that was in the 1700s where the temperature was abnormally low. So there have been some significant fluctuations. But see, I put global warming there because this was, this was, if you want to call it that, natural, non-anthropogenic global warming and fluctuations. And you can see again here, this is starting back, this is the end of the last, or the, the glacial maximum here about 20,000 years ago. Temperature starts going up and the sea level therefore starts going up. Right? The, the, the ice sheets are melting, breaking up. And it pretty much leveled off around 8,000 years ago. There's some minor changes. Right? This line here, I got another graph later on to show you what's happening there. At, at the moment though, we're back in a sea level rise period and this is the anthropogenic part of it here my battery just went uh, a little bit left. So the sea level is starting to rise again, and this time we think it's us, uh, global warming effect. Yeah, here's again, this is concentrating on since the, uh, the Holocene is the modern period, since the last ice age. And again, you can see there's all sorts of evidence that sea level has, has risen and pretty much stabilized up until now anyway. We'll go back to that in a minute. Now, interestingly enough, there, there, are three, there are three sheets left. There are three major ice sheets left on Earth. One is Greenland. Greenland is largely covered by ice. This is um, uh, a Google Earth image, satellite photo. This doesn't show the sea ice. I don't know how they took it out. Uh, they must have done some photoshopping, but uh, this doesn't show any floating ice. We'll get back to that also. But, but this, is per this is the permanent, we hope, the permanent Greenland ice cap. The other two ice sheets are in the southern hemisphere and they're both in Antarctica. There's a huge one called the West Antarctic, no, the East Antarctic sheet and a smaller one, the West Antarctic sheet, and there's a mountain range in between. So those three, the two on Antarctica and 
the Greenland one, are the three major ice sheets left on Earth. There are minor pieces, we call them usually glaciers, you know, in the, in the Alps, in the Andes, in the, so a few in the Rockies, in the Canadian Rockies, but, but the majority, by the large majority of the water that's locked up in this is in those three, Greenland and, ice, and Antarctica. One of the big differences between the two poles is that the North Pole, the North Polar region is underwater. This is ocean. So any ice that forms up here is not an ice sheet, it's sea ice, it's floating. And that's one of the reasons you'll see that most of the melting and most of the fluctuation is now taking place in the Arctic because there's no land underneath. Uh, Antarctica, on the other hand, is sitting right at the South Pole, is right about there. Um, is sitting right on the South Pole and um, therefore has collected a huge amount of ice. It would have been interesting if um, you know, the plate tectonics had taken Antarctica somewhere else. The climate of the Earth probably would have been a lot different because I think the main reason we have so much ice locked up in Antarctica is because we have a big chunk of land sitting on the South Pole, you know, collecting ice, basically. If it were out, you know, somewhere in the Pacific, away from the pole, it wouldn't have collected as much ice, and that might have changed things, you know. Right, so 99% of the, of the land base, the ice sheets, is in these three, right, Greenland, this is the west one, the east one is relatively small. Just to show you how big Antarctica is, there's Texas. You always have to put Texas in there. It seems to be a law, a rule. Right? You want to show size, you have to stick Texas in there. Okay. Now what's happening now is that um, particularly the Greenland ice sheet seem, seems to be the most vulnerable. We're seeing increased melting uh, particularly in Greenland. And, and Greenland, remember the Greenland ice sheet is completely on land. In fact, I'll, here's a map. You can see that the margins are land. That's, that's, that's bare land. The only settlements are down in here, a few, few down here. But uh, the ice sheet essentially occupies most of, most of the interior. So when, when water comes off the ice sheet, it essentially drains into the ocean by melting and to some extent calving means breaking off pieces. But you can see you can't do too much of that because oh, I'm at the wrong way. Because most of the ice isn't right on the water. There's a little bit here. There's probably calves up there, maybe down here. So most of it is melt. And that's been happening. Um, uh, the first recorded melt I don't, I don't have a year for that, it was around here. But this stuff showed extensive melting um, as recently as 2005. Now that doesn't mean it melted down to the ground. In fact, what that means is the surface started to melt and run off. There was another big melt in surface melt in 2012. This is, I think, June and July. So by July, there was water on top of the ice all over the ice sheet. This is not a good thing, right? because it means if it's melting, it's running off. In fact, there's a, a picture of that. This is, that's a person. This is water melting off the ice sheet, and a moulin is basically a little uh, drainage channel. So this water is going into the ocean, right? And the increase, the, the melting, um, in Greenland has been increasing steadily over the last couple of decades, I guess. Certainly, as late as 2012, there was a big melt. This is what it looks like when there's surface water. This is basically a, a lake on top of the ice. And a lot of that water then drains down through the cracks in the ice and eventually reaches the, the ocean. The Antarctic sheets are even bigger. They tend to um, drain differently. It's much colder in Antarctica, so you don't get as much melting. But if I scroll back to here, um, ice moves. Uh, we all know about glaciers. Glaciers creep down the valley. Ice is not uh, as rigid as you might think it is, especially under the pressures exerted by all those tons of ice on top. So a lot of the drainage in the Antarctic ice sheets is essentially like glaciers. They're ice streams that slowly move down the valleys and reach. And when they reach 
you know, the shelf, the, the land shelf, they tend to, you know, become ice shelves and then break off. So it's a little different process. In Greenland, it's mostly melting. In Iceland, it's most, I mean, Antarctica, it's mostly uh, creeping and flowing. But again, that's been increasing. Um, oddly enough, and this is something that people who deny um, global warming lo love to cite, snowfall in the interior of a Antarctica is increasing. And every time one of those guys gets a hold of that fact, they say, see, you alarmists, that's actually a consequence of global warming because the oceans around Antarctica are getting warmer, which means there's more water vapor in the air, which means more precipitation on the cold interior. Uh, that's a small effect. The increase in outflow is much greater. So the net, the net change in Antarctica is definitely out to the ocean, ice leaving the land, going to the ocean. And in fact, if you pile up enough snow behind the ice, it actually can speed it up, speed up the motion. Um, so when it reaches the sea, if the sheet becomes an ice shelf, that increases sea level because you, you're now floating, right? The ice is now floating and then it, eventually it breaks off. Um, so it looks like this. The ice flows from the interior. When it reaches the edge, it now floats out onto the ocean and eventually breaks off. And this, these are this becomes sea ice, icebergs, things like that. Um, I took some of these pictures. We went on a trip to Antarctica in 2006 um, on a boat, obviously. Uh, and in fact, we only got, this is about as far down as we got, because you can't, you know, this is, there's mostly ice in here. So but we, we sailed down in here, and you can see a lot of these icebergs that come. No, that's the shelf. So there's no land under that. Um, I said that already. And this is another one. This is sticking off the land. Uh, in 2002, there was a, a ice shelf off this peninsula called the Larsen B ice shelf, a small one. Uh, it broke up. So here's the ice shelf. Here it is breaking up, and it now doesn't exist. And that's happened within the last decade. <coughs> and again, this, you know, what happens is people say, well, it doesn't matter if the ice shelf breaks up because it's already floating. That's not going to affect sea level, right? If it's already floating, it doesn't matter if you knock it off. It's still floating. But the problem is, if you knock this off, that, the weight of that shelf was helping to hold back the ice from the interior. When that falls off, it actually accelerates the flow of ice from the interior. So even, even though losing the ice shelf doesn't directly raise, you know, affect sea level, indirectly it, it will increase the flow of ice from the interior, which will increase sea level. And that's, that's one of the things they're really worried about. That, that Anything that accelerates the flow of ice from the interior of Antarctica, you know, could have some dramatic effects on sea level. And you get these, this ice, I don't know if that looks like a parrot or something. This shows you the scale down there. This is, these are floating, that's an ice, these are all icebergs. That's the, that's the peninsula behind it. And, and that's the, partly rocks, but it's also just ice up there. Again, showing you the scale. That was the boat we were on. Obviously, I wasn't on the boat when I took the picture. They weren't leaving without me, though, by the way. And you can't show Antarctica without showing at least one penguin. So there's your penguin. That's a Gen 2, I think. By the way, penguins are not as pretty as you think. This one looks pretty clean because they're, they eat fish, and they're always slobbering fish guts on themselves, and they smell terrible. <coughs> They smell terrible. Yeah. There, goes, there goes the romance. It's not, it's not like the movies. Okay. Now, in the Arctic, it's an entirely different situation. Because remember, the North Pole is underwater. So this is all water. So any ice that forms there is sea ice. It's floating. But look what's happened to the sea ice 
this is uh, taken at the same time of the year, 1984, this is 18 years, no, 28 years later, 2012, drastic shrinkage. Uh, sea ice is much more vulnerable because it's, it's in the water already, right? Um, and this is another graphic showing uh, both the uh, historical and the predictions. This blue was the level in 1980. Again, I'm assuming they pick the same. The sea ice fluctuates a lot with the season. It, it expands in the winter and shrinks in the summer. And then by, I can't read that number. This is 2000, 2007. But the predictions are by, 2000, by 2100, there will be essentially a little bit left attached to Greenland. That's a, these are actually shelves here. And this is happening now. The, um, the, the, the Arctic ice, you remember the old dream of the Northwest Passage? We're pretty close. Northwest Passage, uh, the European uh, uh, seafarers wanted to go to the west coast of North America from Europe without going around South America. So they figured, well, let's sail north of North America instead of south of South America. Of course, what they ended up is hitting the ice and then turning back. But we're getting to the point where it's going to be possible. By the way, Anybody know who finally did sail? How did we sail from the Atlantic to the Pacific around the North Pole? It's been done. Submarines. Yeah, nuclear submarines. Nuclear submarines do it routinely. I don't know if they do it often, but the first vessel that navigated the Northwest Passage was a nuclear sub um, and went under the ice. It just shows you it's all open. Um, the th not only is it decreasing, but it's thinning. Here's the Here's an average thickness. I don't know where this was taken, but the light blue is the, uh, the thickness in, two, in 1980. And you can see it's maybe two thirds as thick now. So it's not only breaking up, it's thinning. And of course, for the Arctic, you don't show penguins, you show polar bears. This is a particularly disturbing picture, I think. Um, I feel sorry for that guy. Of course, they're very good swimmers, but they have to get, they have to get out onto something solid uh, eventually. Now, you think, well, sea ice, you know, why do we care about the sea ice unless you're a polar bear? It doesn't affect the ocean levels, right? It freezes, it thaws, it freezes, it thaws. But it does change something called albedo. Albedo is essentially how efficiently a surface reflects light radiation, you know. Snow-covered ice reflects about 90% of the light that hits it. So only about 10% of the light and heat would penetrate. Bare ice is about 50%. Open ocean, only about 6% albedo, which means 94% of the solar radiation warms up the ocean. This is a huge effect, right? Ice cover, and we know this, you can even see this in New Jersey. One of the reasons it's been so cold lately is because there's so much snow. It reflects, you know, the sun doesn't warm up the, the area as efficiently if most of it's reflected off the snow back into the... Fortunately, New Jersey snow gets kind of grimy pretty quickly, so that's a good effect. But what happens here is as, as the ice melts, exposing ocean, or land for that matter, land has a low albedo as well, but ocean's even lower. As the, as the ice melts, exposing the ocean open, open ocean, Less and less light is reflected, more and more is absorbed, and the temperature goes up more. What happens when the temperature goes up more? More of the ice melts. That's why I label this as positive feedback. So in other words, the loss of Arctic sea ice is going to contribute to global warming by reducing the reflectance. Now, the other side of it is clouds tend to increase the albedo. Right? So if, if all that water, warmer water, creates more clouds, that's a negative feedback because the tops of the clouds reflect light back, you know, better than, than the surface. So, you know, this is one reason why the predictions are so difficult. And this is another thing that people who uh, deny global warming like to seize on. The fact that people will come up, scientists will come up with predictions that have these huge ranges. And the reason the ranges are so huge is we don't really understand the processes well enough to nail it down, you know, to precise numbers which means, of course, it must be false, right? 
So again, you know, the difference between you know, a reflective surface and an absorptive surface can be really important. So we get back to the sea level. This is the one I had before showing the last 8,000 years. If we focus in on the last 120 years, 130 years, things, you know, notice that look, this looks really flat. Nothing's happening. But that's because we didn't really zoom in to here. If we zoom in to here, whoops, things are starting to go up again. And sea level has been rising steadily since, uh, certainly since 1920 and it's actually accelerating a bit. The reason this is a different color is um, these are very accurately now measured by satellite altimetry. Um, you might think, well, what's more accurate than actually measuring the surface, you know, just sticking a meter in there, a meter stick. But remember, you know, tides and other things, there's a lot of fluctuation in, in, in sea levels with the, the tides going in and out and seasonal changes, but um, these we can measure quite accurately the average sea level using satellite imagery and uh, definitely going up. Now this doesn't sound like a lot from here to here. Well, actually that is a lot. 20 centimeters is, um, is about eight inches, which doesn't sound like much, but it is a pretty significant rise and it's probably accelerating. So what, you know, what's bad about sea level rising, right? We'll all be closer to the ocean. I live over in Middlesex County, I might have oceanfront property pretty soon, you know, that's kind of cool. The problem, of course, is that a whole lot of people, I mean, who doesn't want to live near the ocean, right, uh, lives within a few feet of sea level. Uh, many of them, um, not in New Jersey, but many of them live in, in developing nations. Um, and, and the significance here is that if, if conditions are already difficult because of poverty and overcrowding, rising sea level is going to make them that much worse. Um, so the, 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 the physical displacement, I mean, think of Bangladesh, for example. Most of Bangladesh is, under, is near sea level and could be underwater. Um, what do you do with, how many people are there in Bangladesh? I don't know, 100 million, 200, 500? I mean, that's more than that. A lot of people. Yeah. Um, where, what do you do? How do you help them? Also, there's, there's monetary cost. Um, if, now, these are worst case scenarios, but if the whole uh, Greenland ice sheet melted, or the Antarctic ice sheet, they're about the West Antarctic, they're about the same size. You can see that most of southern Florida would be underwater. Uh, on the other hand, if the, the huge ice sheet in East Antarctica melted, there would be no more Florida. Some people might think that's a good thing, but certainly not the people who live in Florida. Um, uh, Texas is under less threat, but see, this, this is an interesting chart. This, if you can read it behind the cloud here, this is a chart showing homes lying less than three feet above mean high tide. The darker color, the worse things are. Florida is the worst. And the whole, the whole state of Florida is within a few feet of sea level, basically. New Jersey's not in good shape. New York is a little misleading because wh where are all the homes in New York that are near sea level? Yeah, they're down, they're down here in the city and out on Long Island. So most of New York, of course, is, and New Jersey, of course, it's mostly along the coast. California has a huge coastline a lot of, and a lot of people living there. Texas, surprisingly a little less vulnerable, but uh, Louisiana, of course. So this is a lot of people, and this is the United States. Um, that's, that's a picture of Venice during the, one of the recent floods. Venice lies right almost on sea level and it's constantly getting flooded. This is St. Mark's Square. And this woman is up to her mid-thigh mid in water. Um, this is a particularly disturbing, I don't know where this is. It must be down in the Gulf because these are pelicans. But there's a house that's been abandoned because of rising waters. The, the monetary cost can be staggering, and some of the most vulnerable places are in the U.S. And this is not so much because they're the most vulnerable, but because the real estate's so expensive as well. Um, you know, flooding Manhattan uh, or Miami or New Orleans, uh, but but a lot of third world areas. This is uh, Mumbai. Uh, Kolkata is right near 
Bangladesh. Um, enormous costs associated both monetary and human costs with rising sea levels. What if you have a, a million people who live near sea level and you have to move them? How do you do that? No. Uh, I went to a, a talk or a seminar down in uh, New York Academy of Sciences and they were talking about, it was right after Sandy, so people were talking about what do we do? You know, we put lids on the subway entrances so they don't fill up with water, whatever. And one of the things people say, like for New York Harbor, well, you have to put big gates in at various places at the bottom of the harbor to keep the water out, you know, the storm surge or whatever. And, and um, this, one of the experts said, well, that might work in the short term, but remember, if the sea level's really going up and the rainfall is increasing, there's going to be just as much water behind the gates as in front. So it's not a long term. There are no... So somebody asked him, well, if, if sea gates won't work in the long term, what do you do? And he said, you evacuate. Now, long term, we're talking about 40, 50, 60 years from now. Um, some of you might get there, you know. Um, but th these, these, are real, these are real threats. Uh, and we don't really know. I don't think anybody has a real good plan for what to do about it. Um, and you might say, well, let's take care of global warming, which is a really good idea. Nobody's doing, uh, Bob's going to talk about it. Is Bob DeSaro here? I saw it. You're going to talk about some of this stuff in a few weeks. But, um, the problem is, as you can see from some of the data that people have been gathering, that it's happening now. If we stop dumping things into the atmosphere now, there still is going to be some warming, and we don't show many signs of stopping. So, um, now, I, I mentioned getting yeah. I mentioned there are other things we could have talked about for other topics and other uh, places, but um, for example, I didn't talk at all about the fact that water is an extremely good solvent, and that has a lot to do with geologic processes. Uh, obviously, when you get into biology, virtually all of our biochemical processes take, case, take place in an aqueous environment. And the properties of water really govern life. This is what we do. Uh, I mentioned very briefly water resources. Is Emily here? No, that she, uh, Emily Standard did a lot of work in uh, Jordan, right, on water resources. Water resources is going to be a, uh, uh, maybe one of the critical factors in determining the future of, of people on the earth. You know, the majority of people on earth, I didn't put these slides in. First of all, it's depressing and we don't have time. But the majority of people on the earth live in places where water is scarce and getting scarcer. Not New Jersey so far. We've got plenty of water. But water, you know, there's not much fresh water to go around and we're rapidly using it up. And, you could, and the list goes on. There's a lot of other things we could talk about involving water. But I'm going to stop here. Thank you.